You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. Today's Bible, June 26, 2022. This is read by Reverend Yong Cho Park. I'll be reading the narration that will be autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message, Death Precedes the Resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. Well then, should we keep on sitting so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined Him in the death? For we died, were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its powers in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with Him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and He will never die again. Death no longer has any power over Him. When He died, He died once to break the power of sin, but now that He lives, He lives for the glory of God. So. You also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. Today's Bible, June 26, 2022. This is read by Reverend Yong Cho Park. I'll be reading the narration that will be autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message Death Precedes the Resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. Well then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined Him in the death? For we died, were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with Him in His death, we will also be raised to life as He was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its powers in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with Him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and He will never 
die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. You are listening to KZT Cornerstone Online Live. My name is Newton Ha. Today's Bible, June 26, 2022. This is read by Reverend Yong Cho Park. I'll be reading the narration that will be autocast through Facebook and YouTube channels. Today's mystery message, Death Precedes the Resurrection. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. Well then, should we keep on sitting so that God can show us more and more of His wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? Or have you forgotten that when we were joined with Christ Jesus in baptism, we joined Him in the death? For we died, were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father. Now we also may live new lives. Since we have been united with him in his death, we will also be raised to life as he was. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ so that sin might lose its powers in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin, for when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. And since we died with Christ, we know we will also live with him. We are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead, and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So, you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. That's what it means to be unified with Christ. You're dead to your sin. You are alive, living a brand new life. And you are free from the power of sin. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 through 11. This morning what I want to speak to you about is what it means to be in Christ. What it means to be in Christ. So when you look at the book of Romans, up to this point, let me give you a bit of, a, of structure to the book. In Romans chapter 1 through the first half of Romans chapter 3, Paul presents his argument for the condemnation of sinners. 
In the second half of Romans chapter 3, all the way through chapter 5, Paul presents his argument not for the condemnation of sinners, but for the justification of sinners. That is, how a sinner moves from being condemned to being reconciled with God, having right relationship with God. And how are we reconciled? How do we come into right relationship with God the Father, our judge? We come into right relationship by faith in the Lord Jesus. And as a gift of grace, God gives us the gift of a righteous standing. In other words, he justifies us in a legal sense. So in one through the first half of three, it's the condemnation of sinners. In the second half of chapter three, all the way through five, it's the justification of sinners. And now in chapter six, through part of chapter eight, he is talking about the sanctification of sinners, the sanctification of sinners. That's just a 10 cent word that means you are being made holy. You are being made to look more and more and live more and more like Jesus. That is the purpose for which God has saved you, not just to wipe your slate clean. And God did not just save you to give you everlasting life and to save you from an eternity in hell. God saved you so that you would live like Jesus, not just in eternity. God saved you so that you will begin living like Jesus now. And that is the reality. Now, Paul has just made a a, a massive argument about the grace of God, the gift of God's grace, where he gives us the right standing, the justification from God by faith. And he makes this comment at the end of chapter 5, in verse 20 and 21. Let your eyes fall down. Chapter 5, verse 20 and 21. He said, now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased... Grace abounded all the more, so that sin reigned in death. Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So where sin increased, what followed? Grace. Grace abounded all the more. Now Paul has been facing difficulty Paul has been facing opposition everywhere he goes, and he knows this is going to be a response from the people in Rome, from people who would read this letter, and they start reading about grace. They start reading about how where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So there's a response that Paul anticipates, and that's the subject there of our preaching portion for this morning. I want you to walk away with something. And if you can only pay attention for about 30 seconds more, let me give you just a single sentence to summarize the entire sermon. So if you will, grab a pen and write this down with me. If you are in Christ, you are dead to sin and alive to him. If you're in Christ, you are, not you will be, You are dead to sin and alive to him. You could even say alive for him. You could write this in your Bible. If you are a person who is in Christ, you could say, I am in Christ. Therefore, I am dead to sin and I am alive to live for Jesus. That's what it means to be saved. I could have entitled this sermon, What It Means to Be Saved. What salvation really means. The point that Paul makes is, yes, about salvation. What it means to be saved. More acutely or more specifically, Paul's point is what it actually means to be in Christ. As a person in Christ, does that simply mean that God just pours his grace on me no matter what I do? And therefore, I have the right or the license to do whatever I want to do because God will forgive me. Now, we would heartily say, no, God doesn't show me grace when I sin as an encouragement for me to be lawless. Lawless. 
God has not shown us his grace in order to lead us down a path of moral anarchy. Now, we would agree with that, and we would say, yes, I agree with that totally. The question is not, do we agree with that mentally? The question is, do we agree with that and live it out practically? Do we truly understand the nature of union with Christ? Paul's going to tell you here in verse 1 through 3 that a person who thinks that they should sin just to receive more grace from God, they have a fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be saved. They have a fundamental misunderstanding of what it actually means to be in Christ. In verses 1 down through verse 3, that's what he explains. That fundamental misunderstanding. In verse 4 all the way down through verse 7, you see three results. Three results that come from your union with Christ. And how are you unified with Christ? By faith. When you put your faith in Jesus, you come into union with him. So in verses Four down through seven, you see three results of that union with Christ. And then in verse eight through 11, you see one massive practical application that you must live out in response to the things that are accomplished because of your union with Christ. So look with me at verse one through three and see where Paul addresses or how Paul addresses this, this claim to antinomianism. This claim to freedom to be lawless, that is. Look at what he says. What shall we say then? In response to grace abounding all the more, what shall we say? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Yeah, I ask that. I, I, I read that question and I, I think of two things. I think, first of all, about the intent of that question. What is the intent? Of that question. What is the intention behind that question? Can I continue in sin in order to receive more grace from God? What's the intention behind that? The intention behind such a question is a wicked heart. It is a wicked heart. Somebody thinking they can have the best of both worlds. Somebody thinking they can just continue to, to live in moral degradation and depravity and yet at the same time be treated as a child of God with all the benefits therein. Just the best, best of both worlds. I can continue to be rotten but treated like I'm righteous. Is that really what you told me here, Paul? What's that a symptom of? That is a symptom of a sick corrupt and wicked heart. We should not be looking for opportunities to justify ungodliness. So I think that's behind the intention of the question. Paul doesn't address the intent of the question. Paul addresses the fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be unified with Christ. What shall we say then? Verse one, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound. By no means. Meganoitoi. In, in other words, he says, forbid the thought. That is absurd. You could put about five exclamation points after that one phrase. Perish the thought is the literal rendering of what he's saying. You can't think that way. By no means. Why? How can we who died to sin, still live in it. He goes away and he, he gives a bit of it away, doesn't he? So to be unified with Christ means that you have died to sin. In other words, if you have not died to sin, you are not what? You're not unified with Christ. How can we who died to sin, to past tense event, who died to sin still live in it? After you have said that Jesus is your Savior, Jesus is your Lord, you're dead to your old way of life, how do you, after that fact, continue to live a lost person's life? How do you continue to walk in ungodliness? It's unconscionable to Paul. He, he just can't even fathom it. For him, it's not paradoxical, it's impossible. You know what a paradox is? A paradox is something that is seemingly untrue 
yet it is true. It's a paradox. You could have a giant shrimp. It's an oxymoron and it's a paradox. It seems like you couldn't have a giant shrimp, but some of those things get really big, right? But for Paul, this idea of, of getting more grace by sinning more, that's not a paradox. That's just an impossibility. It, it misunderstands fundamentally what it means to be born again. Listen to what he says. How can we, you died to sin, still live in it? Here's where you misunderstand. Verse three, do you not know? Do you not know? Do you not understand this already? That all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. This is really the first mention in the book of Romans that we have to baptism. I don't think Paul is necessarily laying down a doctrine of baptism here. I don't think he's necessarily making a treatise on the doctrine of baptism. He is making a treatise. He is making an argument on what it means to be unified with Christ. Now, baptism is the way in which we express the faith by which we are unified with Christ. For Paul, there was no concept in his mind of a church service like we have. Do we understand that? There was not a concept of a church service in the same way that we have a church service, and especially not in the same way that we have an invitation. For Paul, whenever people would come to faith in the first century, they would have baptism services. I believe what prevents me from being baptized. And they would go find water and they would express their faith immediately by mode of baptism. For us, it's a little bit different. A person walks the aisle, they walk down front, they talk to the preacher and say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I believe in Jesus. And then the preacher gives the opportunity for that person to invite their family to come. We schedule a baptism. Sometimes it's a week, sometimes it's a month after a person has professed faith in Christ. For Paul, there is no disparity between the two. For Paul, when a person expressed faith in Christ, they did so through baptism. They didn't do it by walking the aisle. They did it by taking the first step of obedience and proclaiming their union with Christ in the act of baptism. So let's talk about what baptism is actually a display of. Baptism is the way in which I say, just as Jesus died for my sins and was buried as the seal, as the signet of his death. Burial is quite final, isn't it? So just as Jesus died for my sins and was buried for my sins, so also I am dead to my sins. And as a seal and as a signet and as a finality to my death to sins, I am buried under the water as Jesus was buried in the ground. And just as Jesus was raised up from the dead by the power of God to live everlastingly forever to God, so also I am raised out of the water just like Christ. I am raised out of the water to live a new life. For Paul, baptism is the public profession of faith. It is the mode by which a person says, I believe in Jesus to the point that I am completely unified with him in the solidarity of his death for sins and his resurrection to new life. Paul says that that union being baptized, not just in the name of Christ. Notice that he doesn't say that. In Matthew 28, he tells us to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Look at what Paul says here, that all of us who have been baptized, verse three, into, into, ace, into Christ Jesus. That means you move from being outside of Christ outside of fellowship and unity with Christ to actually moving into not just a relationship, but a union with Christ. You say, well, what is that? It is a mystery to me, quite honestly, exactly what Paul means by you and I, by faith, being unified with Christ. 
It's a mystery to me exactly how that happens. But Paul speaks of it in such a way that it is a miracle. It is a work of God whereby he takes a person dead in their trespasses and sins, makes them alive in Christ Jesus and bonds you, binds you to him. So much so that in 1 Corinthians, Paul, he rebukes the Corinthian church because they have been engaging in sexual immorality. And you know what he tells them? He tells them that when they engage in sexual immorality, that they are bringing Christ into that because they are so unified with him. And it's appalling to Paul that anybody would ever do something like that. Listen to how this is explained in other portions of scripture. Colossians 1, 27, Paul says this, this is the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you. He says it's a mystery. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Listen now, he says in Colossians chapter three, one through four, if then you have been raised with Christ, Seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on the things that are on the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Listen to what Paul says in Galatians 2. Verse 20, this is a verse to memorize. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For Paul, that's what it means to have faith in Christ such that you have obeyed him through baptism and have been mystically, supernaturally, miraculously bound and unified to Christ. I don't know how to explain all that, but I sure know it's good. And I know that that changes everything. That changes everything because it is no longer I who live. If you are in Christ, it is no longer the old you who is living. It is Christ living in you. You are a different creature. You're a different person. You are a new being and you have been unified with Christ. Listen to what he says. How can we who died to sin still live in it? It's unfathomable to Paul that a person would actually think that after they have past tense died to their sins, that afterwards they can still live in ungodliness. See, John is just as forthright as Paul is. I'm going to read a lengthy passage to you because John does a much better job explaining this than I can. First John chapter three, verse five through nine. John says this, you know that he, that is Jesus, this will be on the board for you. First John three, verse five through nine, you know that that he appeared in order to take away sins and in him there is no sin. So what is the purpose for which Jesus came? To take away sins. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep sinning because he has been born of God. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? 
John says, if you make a practice of sinning, you prove that you have not been born of God. You prove that you were never changed in the first place. You prove that you had never died to sin in the first place. And you prove who you are of in truth. Now, does this mean that a person in Christ is incapable of sinning? That's not what John nor Paul has said. He said, Paul said, live in it. John said, keep on sinning. Make a practice of sinning. See, there's a difference. There's a difference in walking down the road and tripping in a pothole. And walking down the road and jumping headlong into the ditch. There's a difference between the two. One of them happens every once in a while. You're not meaning for it to happen, but you slip and you stumble and you trip. The other one is a deliberate choice to live in rebellion against God. And John and Paul are saying people who live in deliberate rebellion against God are not saved. You ever wonder why people ask the question, are, is it once saved, always saved? Once saved, all, you know why people ask that question? My, my question is, what's the intention behind that question? The intention behind the question, are we say, once saved, always saved? The intention behind that question is not necessarily to get at the point of the security of the believer. The intention behind that question most often is because a person is overwhelmed with their guilt because they keep sinning and they want to know if they're lost or not. When God bears a person again, they do not keep on sinning. When God saves a person, he saves them to the end. A person cannot lose their salvation any more than they can become unborn again. If a person continues in sin, they never died to it. That's why it's unfathomable for Paul, for a person to say, can we just continue in our sin that grace may abound? What's the problem here? A grace abuser has a fundamental misunderstanding of what it means to be in union with Christ. Fundamental misunderstanding. So Paul gives you three results that come from your union with Christ. He gives you those three results in verse four down through verse seven. There's actually two of those results in verse four. Verse 4a, you have the first. Write this first result down of your union with Christ. In Christ, you are dead to sin. In Christ, you are dead to sin. Listen now how he says it. First part of verse four. We were buried Therefore, with him by baptism into death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Death to what? What did Jesus come to die for? He came to die for our sins. And so if we have been unified with him in death, then just as he died for our sins, we die to our sins. See, we don't want to die for our sins or else we go to hell. But we do want to die to our sins because Jesus has already paid the price for them. So Paul says, if you've been baptized, buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, you have died to your sins. That's what it means to be in Christ. You're dead to this old way of life. Look at the second result of being in union with Christ. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. Here's a purpose statement, verse 4. In order that, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. Christ died for your sins to pay the penalty for your sins. He also died for your sins to set you free from the power of sin. And he was raised from the dead in order for you to live a new life. That's the second result of you being in union with Christ. Not only are you dead to your sins, but number two, in Christ, you now live a brand new life. You now live a brand new life. Now, some people, they could honestly stop right there because they need to do a little bit of work. Some people could stop right there because they need to do a little bit of work. Because when they look at that and they say, well, I still live in my sin. 
There's no progression in holiness. I'm not, I'm not more sanctified or more holy now than I was when I first said I believe. When I first walked the aisle, maybe what happened was you were not truly believing in Jesus. Maybe you were not truly born again. Maybe you were baptized in the water, but you weren't baptized into Christ. Maybe it was that you followed somebody down the aisle, but the one you followed down the aisle wasn't Jesus. It might have been a friend or it might have been peer pressure. But maybe today what you need to do is say, today I will give my life to Jesus with my whole heart for all of my days. I will be unified with Christ. I will follow him. I am with him and he is in me. You dead to your sins and you live a brand new life. Some people still live in their sins. Some people, their life looks no different today than it did when they said they first believed. And why is that? It is most likely because you were not born again in the first place. As hard as that is to say. But God's purpose for you is that you be in Christ that you live a brand new life. Listen to Jesus talk about how he wants you to be in him, unified with him. John chapter 17, verse 20 through 21. This is Jesus' high priestly prayer before he went to the cross for you and I. Listen to what Jesus prayed to the Father on you and my behalf. Listen to this. I do not ask for these, my disciples only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus' prayer indicates here that your union with Christ, your death to sin, and your new life of righteousness is actually going to be a tremendous, if not the pinnacle, evangelistic tool to reach people for Jesus. That the world may know that you sent me. People are supposed to be able to see the difference that has taken place in your life. I think that's the point. What Jesus is saying there, if you're in Christ, you're dead to sin and you now live a brand new life. Now look at verse five through seven, verse five through seven. You see this third result. He says, for if, if we have been united with him, with Jesus in a death like his death to sin, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We shall certainly be. We will be. What tense is that verb in? We will be. That's a future tense verb, isn't it? It's a future tense. If we have died, that's aorist, that's a past tense. We will be united with him in a resurrection. So in the future tense. Is Paul saying here that if we died to our sins, that in the end, when Jesus returns, we'll be raised up from the dead? That would be a genuine future event. Paul would be talking about what happens when Jesus returns. I would make the argument here that Paul is not talking about a genuine future event. He's talking about a logical future event. In other words, what he's saying is, if you truly died with Jesus to your sins, then after that fact, after that fact, you were also raised with him to live a new life. Like this has certainly happened. If you did die, then you do live a new life. There's an inseparable connection for Paul between the justification of a sinner and the sanctification of God's people, of their holy making. As he say, for if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. 
So why have we been brought into union with Christ? Why have we died to our sins? We've died to our sins in order that we would no longer be, here it is, enslaved, enslaved to sin. If time permitted, I would take you through the Pauline theology where Paul explicitly teaches that without Christ, you and I are slaves to sin. What is it that Jesus says? He says, whoever sins is a slave to it. A slave has no choice but to do what the master says. That means apart from the new birth, apart from God changing your heart, all you did was sin. You didn't live by faith in God. You were never pleasing to God by your actions and you could do nothing else until God changed your heart. But now that God has changed your heart, you know what he's done for you? He has set you free from that slave master. He has set you free from the power of sin. Third result of union with Christ. In Christ, you are free from the power of sin. You are free from the power of sin. In other words, if you sin, it's not because you had to. It's because you chose to. If you sin as a believer in Jesus, if you sin, it is never because you had to. It is always because you chose to. If you sinned because you had to, what you are saying is you were never saved in the first place. Because when you were united with Christ, he set you free from the slave master of sin. Where you are now able to do the right thing. So when you sin against somebody, when you sin against God, don't say, I don't know why I did that. Don't say, I couldn't help myself. It's just the way that I am. No, it's not. You chose to do that. You chose to live that way. Christ has set you free from bondage to do what sin tells you to do. You don't have to do wrong. You can do what's right. In Christ, you are free from the power of sin. So if you sin, it's not because you had to. It is always because you have absolutely chosen to do that. What does Paul say here? He says, we know that our old self, our old person, who we used to be, what happened to that old rascal? He was crucified with him. With Jesus, in order that the body of sin, the desires, the passions of sin that dwell in us, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we'd no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, that word set free is the word justified. For one who has died has been justified from their sin. They have been set free. See, Paul does two things here. Paul is talking about being set free legally from the power of sin. And he is also be saying that you are set free practically from the power of sin. If you have died to your sins with Christ, Jesus paid for the penalty of your sin. And he also sets you practically free from the power of sin such that you don't have to sin. Now, do we stumble and fall? Yes, we do. First John 1, 8 through 9. If we say we have no sin, we lie. But if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We don't have to do what's wrong. Listen to what Paul says about putting off the old self. Ephesians 4 22 through 24, he says, put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Paul has told us that is the purpose for which you have been unified with Christ. Christ. 
So you could shed away that old man. So you could shed away those old deeds. And so that you could live a new life empowered by the Spirit in Christ. Living a life of holiness and righteousness. That is the purpose for which God has saved you from your sins. And that's what it means to be unified with Christ. You're dead to your sin. You are alive living a brand new life. And you are free from the power of sin. Now look at verse 8 through 11. Verse 8 through 11, you see one massive application point based on those three results of your union with Christ. This will go very quickly. He says now, verse 8, if you have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live, live today. Not just live in the future. We believe that because we died in the past with him, that we will today live with him. We know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. Let me try to draw this tightly to make it clear. It says the death that Christ died, how many times did he do that? One time. After Jesus died on the cross, did he have to rededicate his life 10 times? No, he didn't. Did Christ go through this process of, well, I died for sins. I, I got to go back and die again. I got, I got to go back and die again. No, he didn't. Once he had died to sin, that was it. It was done. It was finished. And thanks be to God, he doesn't have to die for my sins multiple times. Once he died for my sins, that was it. It was done and it was completed. Friend, if you have truly given your life to Jesus, that's it. It's completed. And if you are having to constantly recommit your life to the Lord because you continue to walk in sin, maybe you need to judge whether or not you have truly ever been born again. That's what Paul is saying here. Jesus is not doing this multiple times. You and I should not have to either. It is once and for all. The life that you lived is dead and was buried in the water with Christ when you expressed faith in him. And the life that you now live is brand new in him. You are free from the power of sin. You are able to do what is right. You are able to walk in righteousness and you must walk in righteousness. Now, I love this application point that Paul delivers here. It's just that final uppercut punch in the boxing match in verse 11. He says, so you also, just as Jesus died once for sins and that was it. So you also must logizestai, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. In chapter five, when Paul was talking about how Abraham was justified by faith, it says that Abraham believed God. He references Genesis 15. Abraham believed God and God logizomai. He counted it to him as righteousness. In other words, because Abraham believed that God did the impossible or would do the impossible, God counted that on him. He considered it done. He considered Abraham righteous. So now Paul uses the same word that described earlier how God looks at us who are in Christ. And now he says, that's how you must look at you. See what he did there? This is how God sees you. He counts you as righteous. Therefore, what? So you also must consider yourself. You must reckon yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. In other words, God treats you as righteous. You better start treating you as righteous. God looks at you as your sins being paid and you being in right standing with him. Now you need to act like it. That's what Paul's saying. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No, God doesn't count our sins against us anymore. He counts us as righteous. 
So we need to live like that. We must live like that. To be unified with Christ is to be dead to sin. It's to live a brand new life. It is to have power over sin. So if that has truly taken place, friend, live like it. Live like it. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. There are some who are here today and you are not dead to your sin. You are dead in your sin. You are not alive to God. You are dead in your sin. But if you will, by faith in the Lord Jesus, say, God, I am dead in my sin. I cannot break the power that sin has over me. I continually fall. I walk in my sin. I live in my sin. Lord, would you forgive me of my sin? Lord, I believe in Jesus. God will do that same miraculous, supernatural work in your life. He will free you from your sin. He will give you a brand new life. And that life begins today. And it goes on forever. The death that Christ died, he died one time. And the life he was raised to, he lives in forever. So also, if you put your faith in Jesus today, you will begin a brand new life with the Lord, walking in righteousness, free from the power of sin, and that life will never end. If you are in Christ, you are dead to sin and alive to him. Would you pray with me?